Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 672 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 27th of January 2023 as I record this. Can you believe it's almost February? (laughs) In today's show I'm talking to Steve Piper about selling books direct, why it's a good idea even if you're starting out and how it empowers you to be really independent and take control of your author business as well as why Steve writes under a pen name. And also for a tiny segment towards the end, we talk about why he's excited about NFTs as a musician and an author. Now, I know I haven't mentioned NFTs for a while as the news has been all about AI, but I still think digital original assets will be important for our future businesses. It's just taking its time to get here. And remember, I'm usually five years early. (laughs) So I started talking about AI in 2016 and it really took off in 2022. And I started with NFTs on this show in March 2021. So we've got some time before it's likely to be mainstream, but Steve's certainly excited about it too. But most of the interview is on selling direct on Shopify. So that is in the interview coming up. In publishing and book marketing news. Well, this week there was an email from ACX, which is the self-publishing platform for Audible. And it said, starting today, Audible is reducing prices on titles, including ACX titles across the site. While we cannot make projections on a title-by-title basis, we anticipate that price reductions will lead to increased sales for titles overall. In tandem, as the vast majority of Audible content is purchased with a credit, you should expect your average royalty per unit for credit sales to remain steady. So on the face of it, it's a lovely email. (laughs) It's saying everything's going to be fine and they use increased sales and uh, remain steady. So it shouldn't be a problem. But it's the first sentence that I'm still struggling with, to be honest. Starting today, Audible is reducing prices on titles, including ACX titles. So basically, (laughs) it's a nice way of saying we're reducing your prices on your books. You have no choice. We're doing it. Um, You have no control. (laughs) And in fact, this this gal, I mean, for a while now, I, since Findaway Voices came on the scene, that's findawayvoices.com, I have been uh, publishing my audiobooks wide. But for many of us, when we started out with audio, there was no other choice. And many of us being new in the, uh, I guess, this industry, we did royalty share deals and they're all locked into exclusivity. So yeah, anyway, it made me pretty determined <laughs> to get my backlist wide because I hate this lack of control. To get that email just basically saying you have no choice. Mm. So I'm revisiting all my contracts. Now, I love Audible. I think it's wonderful as a customer. I also like getting money from Audible, but and I'm certainly going to continue using Audible for my audiobooks, or at least some of them. <laughs> but um, I do, uh, I, pub- I publish now non-exclusively on all platforms, and that's how I like it to be. So yes, uh, if you, I mentioned this either last week or the week before as well, check out Choke Point Capitalism, the book and also audio book, not on Audible, by Corrie Doctorow and Rebecca Giblin, and also audiblegate.com if you're not aware of the issues uh, through that. So yeah, you might have got that email too. I'm interested as to how you felt about it. It's, it was like a, uh, it was so a bugle call. I think it was a quote from St- Sylvester Stallone saying when people, said to him early in his career, you can't do that. You're not going to be able to do that. It was a bugle call to actually go and do it. (laughs) And that's what I felt was like, right then, let's get on with it. And talking of empowerment, Dean Wesley Smith is doing a series on his blog about valuing your intellectual property and not just valuing it 
in terms of mindset, but actual valuation in terms of financial figures. And in, in his latest article, again, links in the show notes, or he's at deanwesleysmith.com, he talks about Justin Bieber's recent deal to sell rights to his music catalogue for $200 million. Now, I'm not a Bieber fan or whatever they're called, <laughs> but Justin is only 28. And so clearly he has hopefully a long career in front of him. And it brings into focus how valuable our creative work can be and the different ways of financially valuing it, including the income approach. Because remember, with music, it's not just the the person playing the music, it's the songwriter, it's producers. The, there's a lot of people who own chunks of the royalties for, for musicians, for like far more than with authors generally. So, yeah, and I, I think this series is great. I mean, I've... I've basically learned copyright from Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush, his business partner, his uh, wife, and just fine, amazing uh, um, writers, both of them fantastic business. And it can be really hard to see the value in your IP, especially if you're at the beginning of your author career. But have this long term view. So for example, read On Writing by Stephen King. And he talks about how he started out writing when they were really poor. He and his wife were poor. And he wrote in this horrible laundry, the description of it is just horrible. It's not like nice business shirts. It was a sort of industrial laundry with horrible things on the sheets. (laughs) Or it might even mean like a medical laundry. It was, I, I, re, I remember the description. Um, so while working nights, so basically, and look at him now. I mean, who would know that? And I think it was, would have been like in his 20s or something. And now he's in his 70s. So we all want to live into, at least into our 70s, right? I'm aiming for 95. <laughs> and I want to keep writing. And I mean, who knows how valuable my IP will be uh, by the time I pass on. We shall see. Memento mori, my friends. Remember, you will die. So let's make the most of it while we can. So Dean has a number of courses on copyright, uh, which is fantastic. I mean, and I've learned from Dean and Chris through the business masterclasses in Oregon. They used to run. Now they mainly do online classes, obviously pandemic, but also they don't run that business masterclass anymore. Um, yes, I'm an affiliate of the courses. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash copyright classes, thecreativepen.com forward slash copyright classes and links in the show notes. And they have, um, Dean has this new course, which is like bite-sized copyright. So instead of having to go through a really long sort of videos, although Dean's videos are usually quite short, he's doing these kind of bite-sized things that you can watch a little one every day. So yeah, check that out. And this kind of valuations, kind of money side of things is really good at this time of year. I, at this time of year, I do tend to be doing work around money and mindset. Um, Even though I'm really grateful for my position and what I've done creatively and been full-time since, uh, when was I full-time? 2011, I went full-time. So I've been a full-time author entrepreneur for over a decade. I still have money uh, issues and mindset issues around money and I still want to invest more and all of this. So I wanted to recommend um, some books I've recently listened to. One is Happy Money by Ken Honda. I think I've mentioned this before. I particularly like his metaphor of the lake and the flow. So sometimes we think we want this big lake of money and that will solve all our issues. Like, oh, if only I got a million dollars and it was just there in one big chunk. But he really talks about, yes, of course, we'd love this abundant lake. We'd like to have a chunk. But actually, you need these flows, flows and streams in and out, which fits nicely with the author business model of multiple streams of income. So thinking about it that way in terms of flow instead of a kind of stagnant body of water or money. So I really like that. And that happy money, I think that was that was recommended by Rachel Heron and Sasha Black on um, their podcast. And the next one is Right to Riches by Renee Rose, which is a law of attraction book specifically for authors. Uh, if you're open to the law of attraction, I certainly started when I started my career. The idea of affirmations was a really big deal for me. My first affirmation, if you haven't heard the story before, my affirmation was I am creative. I am an author. And I couldn't even say that out loud. This would have been 2005 ish. 
I am creative. I am an author. I couldn't say it. And then I would put it in my head and I wrote it in my journal and I put a little card in my wallet. And this was when The Secret came out around then. And I was like, okay, if I can just believe I can be creative, somehow I will make it out of my awful job into this brand new world of being an author. And uh, it took a few years, but it came true. (laughs) I am creative. I am an author. So, and of course, authors, we turn what's in our minds into physical objects in the world. Like you write a book, you've turned thoughts into things, which is the basis of of the law of attraction, really. So, uh, and of course, action is part of attraction. (laughs) So anyway, I wanted to recommend this book, Right to Riches by Renee Rose. Um, There's some aspects of the book which are really resonating with me. And what's nice is that it's specifically for authors. So there are lots of these kind of books, but this one is for authors. Um, And when I like books like this, I tend to buy all the formats. So it's also evidence of how with nonfiction, you definitely want all the formats. So I bought this in audiobook. So I bought the ebook first. And then I was like, Oh, this is great. But I'm going on a really long walk. I'll get the audiobook as well. So I bought the audiobook. And then I was like, Oh, I want to have it on my shelf. So I remember about it later. So I bought the paperback and saw there was a workbook. So I bought that too. (laughs) So I am demonstrating the power of nonfiction multiple format buying. Renee was recently on the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, which was how I found the book. So you can also listen to that. And of course, that's a bit woo woo, but sometimes you need a bit of woo woo to go with your practical self as well. I certainly need a bit of woo woo every now and then. So one more recommendation, and this is definitely not woo-woo, the James Altucher podcast uh, episode, recent episode with Trung Fan, which came out on the 26th of January 2023. And it's on failing to predict the future and kind of the worst predictions about technology, where people said, oh, this will never work, like the internet will never work, or, um, you know, computer, people will never want computers and all these things that people have said, very significant people have said, and then have been proved wrong. Now, I dip in and out of James's show, but I really enjoyed this episode. They go into various tech predictions, but also they apply it to AI and blockchain and crypto, um, sort of thinking about how that's going to play out and what kinds of things might be wrong. So if you enjoy my futurist stuff, definitely have a listen to that. So in my personal update, well, it's been a pretty incredible week. And as I record this, the pilgrimage Kickstarter has ticked over £15,000, which is 15 times my original funding goal. It actually funded within minutes and then hit £6,000 before this show went out last Monday. So yeah, it kind of more than exceeded what I thought it would within the first 24 hours, basically. So thank you. Thank you really seriously from my heart thank you if you have backed this campaign or recommended it or shared it with friends or people who might be interested it's actually surprising how many people either want to walk a pilgrimage or the Camino de Santiago or know someone or their mum wants to walk it or their brother or someone they love or a friend or something like that so yeah it's, it's, it might actually be a more popular thing than I originally thought I'm also just I'm really thrilled but I'm also relieved if you um have listened to that Wish I'd Known Then episode or the one uh, clip that I put on this show, the in, the in between episode I just put out, uh, I was really quite scared. I was worried in terms of my, re- I have a bit of a reputation now. I mean, I have a book called How to Market a Book. It'd be very, very embarrassing if I couldn't do this. <laughs> But I am pulling out all the stops now. I want to almost prove a point because I've also heard from travel writers or other people who are like, I'm writing a book of my heart, but presumably it won't sell. And I definitely thought that. I thought that this would not sell that much. But I mean, this is just so good. So I haven't uh, made this much effort in a book launch for a long time. And it is a lot of work and it continues to be a lot of work because, of course, it's not over. As this goes out, it's not over yet. It finishes on the 5th of February, 2023. There's still a few days left as uh, this goes out. So if you are still interested, go to jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage and that link will redirect to the Kickstarter or in the future it will go to my stores. Now, 
I have all the different formats of the book, including a signed hardback. There's also a course on writing setting and sense of place and some digital and print bundles. But also we have hit a stretch goal. So even if you don't want the book, you can still anyway get, if you back the project, you can get um, what was my 10k stretch goal, which is a lessons learned from turning hundreds of pages of journal entries and hundreds of photos into a finished travel memoir. So basically, it's going to be like a mini audio book with a transcript, which will be like a short nonfiction book, probably. Uh, And I probably will turn this into a book, but certainly not right now. So this is for backers only. And this will cover how to capture the journey while you're in it. What type of book is it going to be anyway? Figuring out your character arc and your themes. Truth with a capital T versus truth with a little t, which is a big part of memoir. Editing and killing your darlings, since I went from over 100,000 words to around 40,000 words. and much more. So this extra audio and transcript will only go to backers. So if you're interested in writing memoir, you could just buy the ebook or the audiobook for £10 or like that's around, I guess, $12, $13. Or you can just donate and not have even get the book and you'll still get that uh, extra thing, which will, yeah, that's Essentially, if you back the campaign, you get that how to write a travel memoir thing. So yeah, check that out too uh, at jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage. I've also been on other podcasts this week, Travel Writing World with Jeremy Bassetti, Into the Woods with Holly Wharton, Wish I'd Known Then with Sarah Rosette and Jamie Albright, and Sacred Steps with Kevin Donahue. And I've put excerpts on the writing side of things in this show feed, the last episode as this goes out. There's also one about travel, pilgrimage, the spiritual side on my books and travel podcast feed. So yeah, doing those excerpts was actually a lot more work than I expected, but I really like the finished product. So I might actually do some more of those excerpt things as episodes because I think they're interesting, but let me know what you think. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments. Seamus said of Mark Recklau's episode on nonfiction book sales, thanks both, I enjoyed this one, my kind of wacky vibe. And Joanna, thanks for the inspiration. I finally published my first fiction book, thanks to all your information. I feel calm and focused about doing a soft launch and settling in for the long haul. Fantastic. Sunny also said about Mark's interview, I learned a lot, got a lot of new ideas, new perspectives and appreciate the interesting and helpful first person experience. Mark, the great ideas and stories you gave away make your books more attractive over those of similar authors. I thought this was a great comment from Sunny because this is exactly right. This giving away, this generosity is actually what makes people more likely to buy your book. And I know when you start out, you worry, you're like, oh, well, I can't say, I can't say you can find that in the book, you know, because otherwise they won't buy the book. I need to just keep it and then they have to buy it. But no, the more you give away, the more people will actually buy. That's certainly been my experience. Also on Oliver's interview about generative AI, Catherine Goldman said on Twitter, the genie is truly out of the bottle. Yup, AI is, has been here, and we have to figure out how we are going to deal with it. And uh, Catherine is an intellectual property attorney who has been on the show a couple of times before, and she is coming back on to talk about AI and copyright in the next few months. And on YouTube, I love this from Georgia Piazza, said, Oliver is the best guest ever, practical and down to earth. And again, that was on the Generative AI show. So that's good. Glad you all enjoyed those. Now, remember, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog, the show notes or the YouTube channel or the Facebook page, The Creative Pen. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, because however you choose to publish, whether you go direct to readers with Kickstarter or you go indie or you want a traditional deal, you need to make your book the best it can be. 
So I use ProWriting Aid multiple times in my creative process. Once after the full draft is finished, before I print it for hand edits, I open it in Scrivener or I open Scrivener in ProWriting Aid and go through each chapter. Then I print out the book and then I make the changes in Scrivener and then I use ProWriting Aid again before I send it to my editor. And if it's a short story or something, I'll use it again before publishing and uh, after, you know, just before I put it out there. So it is one of my absolute must use tools in my writing process. I use it for every single book. I also use it uh, to check my writing online on my blog and also with uh, notes like this, because of course I have notes as I'm reading my podcast. So why use software to help you? Why don't you just learn all the grammar and writing rules and apply them yourself. Well, we all use tools to improve our process and we are also often blind to our own writing issues. It helps to have another pair of eyes, even if the eyes are software. Now, Pro Writing Aid knows all the rules and helps you apply them. And of course, you can choose not to make the changes if you like, but it helps with making your writing more active, find repeated words, find words you could improve, sentence structure, grammar and punctuation issues, as well as typos, spacing problems and more. There are loads of reports to help improve your writing in multiple ways. So won't an editor do all this? Well, yes, they can do, but I'd rather pay my editor to fix the things that software can't. As brilliant as ProWriting Aid is, it cannot read the manuscript as a whole and comment on bigger issues like character development, inconsistencies or plot holes. So I use ProWriting Aid as my essential editing tool before sending to my human editor. You can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link, prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A. That's prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna. And if you use my links, it really does help the show. And this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time is sponsored by my patrons and they especially support the time needed for in between episodes like the recent one on generative AI art, where I did that longer 30 minute intro on various legal things. I'm especially grateful to those patrons who've been supporting the show for years and months. You're all amazing. Uh, Thanks to new patrons this week, Jennifer Anderson, C. Ruth Taylor. Hi, Ruth. Ruth has been on the show talking about the Caribbean. Rachel Beanie, Barry Carter and Deb. Now, if you support the show on Patreon, you get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only. And I answer all your questions about writing craft, publishing, marketing, making money and more. I also share discount codes, behind the scenes information, early access and more. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars or pounds or whatever your currency is. And you can do that at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Steve Piper is a USA Today bestselling thriller author under the name Lars Emmerich. He's also an entrepreneur and business consultant specializing in digital marketing and selling direct. So welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and a pleasure. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you today. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. Um, That's a great question. I started off as an F-16 pilot. I was actually in pilot training the first time. I think maybe this was the first time I read a Tom Clancy novel. And the way that he wove all of those different stories together was just fascinating to me. And the idea that something is happening in plain sight, but there's a much deeper meaning behind it. That was also very fascinating to me. So I think that's probably the first time I hatched the idea that maybe I would like to write thrillers like that. And it wasn't until maybe 19-ish years later when I found myself traveling all over the country to sit in boring meetings and needing something to do productive with my off time that I really got serious about writing books and came back to it. So tell us a bit more about how your entrepreneurial background sort of fits into writing and publishing. Do you just choose the indie route from the beginning? From the get-go, I had zero interest in the traditional publishing route just because I looked at the contracts and I realized (laughs) this is not a terrific deal really at all. And of course, it's terrific if that's the only deal that they that you have available. But 
when I got serious about writing books, it was during the Joe Conrath Gold Rush era, you know, when there were more Kindles than books available on Kindle kind of a thing. Mm. So the opportunity space really seemed wide open at that point for independent publishers rather than trying to go the traditional route. So I think that that was around 2009. I mean, some listeners won't even have heard of Joe Conrath, which is kind of crazy for those of us who've been around a while because he was an early adopter. But of course, I think he had around 100 books from traditional publishing or at least 50 books that he put into indie. And that's how he kind of started. But you were starting from zero, right? Zero, Back in 2009. Right. So tell us where you are now. Like how many thriller books do you have out there? Um, not enough. Is always the answer. I'm allegedly working on my 13th. <laughs> I say allegedly <laughs> because these other projects keep coming up that uh, I, I, like we were talking about earlier, I have a few too many interests and I'm involved in a few too many businesses. And so I'm doing a what I feel is a relatively poor job of juggling all of the things. <laughs> Most are in the same main series. All of them are either in the series or uh, spinoffs with some of my favorite characters from the series. And then just tell us why you wrote under a pen name. Well, at the time I had a day job and a security clearance and some of my characters do some crazy things. I didn't want to be mistaken for my characters. And so I thought that I would try to keep the world separate. But it was funny though, one time I walked into a classified meeting in a very dark room behind a vaulted door and one of the uh, big wig participants said, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lars Emmerich is here to join us today. <laughs> so I figured <laughs> the cat was out of the bag. <laughs> uh -huh. No, that's great. But I mean, I also find that I like writing fiction under a different name to my nonfiction. And it's almost like there's two personas. Does it help you creatively? Absolutely. I, I come to realize that Lars Emmerich is kind of a character himself. I speak of him in the third person. I talk about the, the uh, book business shorthand around our house is just Lars. Like Lars earned X today, I will, I'll tell my wife or my wife will say, how's Lars doing today? And so it, it kind of has taken on a persona of its own. That's it so funny. Give you a little more freedom. Yeah, it's so funny you say that because my husband says, does uh, Morgan, Morgan Sierra is one of my main characters and he's like, does Morgan want to go to Vienna next month or whatever? <laughs> so because <laughs> yeah. she, she's like my alter ego. So yeah, it's funny how we do that. But I do think it helps creatively. Now let's get into the business side because you're sort of well known now in the author community around selling direct. So why did you decide to focus on selling direct to readers? Well, I was doing what we were all doing, and I guess this was maybe 2017-ish, 18-ish. I was using advertising. I had a long history in digital advertising, and I was using some of what Mark Dawson was teaching, and I was combining some of that with the things that I had learned before. And with some degree of success on Amazon, one day I got an email from Amazon saying, hey, we've looked at your account. There's something suspicious. We're not going to pay you. And I was quite alarmed because to my knowledge, I had done nothing wrong at any point ever. And mm. I wrote them, I took a minute to calm down. <laughs> and then I wrote them a polite email saying, Hey, can you help me understand what's happened and what do I need to fix and what's going on here? And I clicked send. I got a new cup of, cup of coffee. I came back to my desk and the reply had already arrived in my inbox. The reply said, we have reviewed your case. And we have decided to uphold our decision. So we're not going to pay you. And also it admonished me, be very careful with your account. But it gave me no clue what they were mad about. And I never actually spoke to a human. And so I sort of realized this doesn't feel like a healthy business relationship. I really need to do more of controlling my own destiny. And so let me see if I can't just sell these books directly to customers. And that worked. Yeah, so it's so interesting. It feels like at the moment, and it might just be anecdotal or noise, but a lot more people seem to be talking about problems with Amazon accounts. And, you know, things have changed every year, obviously, since the KDP sure, yeah. uh, was launched. But it does feel like more and more authors are having problems. And of course, when your account is closed or there's a problem, they don't pay royalties, right? And if you're paying for ads, that can be a real problem. For sure. And really, for me, it was just the lack of courtesy in the response. It's okay. I mean, things happen. There's so many accounts. They have to check them algorithmically. They can't do it by hand, every single account. I understand, but somebody ought to be available to help clarify. And that wasn't the case. And so I realized that either they're 
ill intentions. I don't think that's the case. Or they've just grown too big to really be able to care all that much <laughs> about individual <laughs> authors. And so either way, though, for me as an individual author, the result was the same, which is I, I didn't feel comfortable having every one of my eggs in that Amazon basket. Mm. Of course, you still sell books on Amazon. Do, yep. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's the other thing, isn't it? I feel like when we talk about selling direct, people think, oh, that means you're ditching everything else. But you're sort of ultimately wide. You sell everywhere. I do. I am ultimately wide. And it's really interesting because the most reliable way I've discovered to improve my Amazon sales is to just advertise my direct sales. And we see this number of authors are doing this direct sales process. And we see that over and over and over again. So it's called cross channel effects. It's kind of a nerdy marketing term, but it is a really effective way. It's kind of like bonus money. Your direct sales system makes money for you. And this big Amazon windfall comes in as well. So that's, it's really, it was a, I was surprised, but mm. pleasantly so. And so it's one of the things we advise folks to do. Hey, don't fire Amazon completely. Keep them in your arsenal, but just don't rely on them completely. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's certainly been my goal over the last few years to reduce the percentage of my business income from that one company. And I mean, that's true whether you have a job or, or not. If everything is dependent on one company and something goes wrong, um, like many people, I was laid off in the global financial crisis back in 2008. And that shaped my own indie author journey. So I feel like that's the same way now. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot I agree. Of people get that wake up call, essentially. So do you find that authors come to you because one of the services has sort of broken in some way or that people are just really wanting their own independence? It's a little bit of both. What's been surprising re recently is the number of very high Amazon earners who are now very serious about direct sales. And without speaking for anybody, my understanding for why that's happening is that they're seeing fluctuations in their own earnings and they also are wanting less dependence on a single source of income. And there are account administration horror stories. People who are doing very well suddenly have their accounts shut off. So I think that that fuels the fears also. But I think it's, it's mainly about diversification, spreading out your risk across a number of different third parties instead of having all of your risk consolidated in one single service that you use. What about empowerment and sort of mindset shift? Because I, I feel like when we all got started or some of us got started over a decade ago, we felt almost embarrassed about being our own publishers and there was the stigma. And now it almost feels like independent authors and independent creators are more empowered to, to do this. Has that been a shift? It certainly has. It's been a shift in my own thinking also. Like I, I've always been sort of iconoclastic and I try to do my own thinking and go in the way that seems best to me, regardless of where everybody else is going. But that has always sort of come with a bit of self-consciousness. Like what if I'm wrong and I'm way out here in the wilderness by myself and nothing good happens? Fortunately, that wasn't the case. But over the years, I think as more of us have seen more success and the relative success per book sold is much greater because our margins are so much better as indies. I think it has made its own argument for people to really take control of their own destiny. But what comes with that is you're now not just a content producer, you're a business owner. And that's an important shift. Not everybody wants to make it. When you do make it, it is very empowering though. It, the buck stops with you and if things aren't going terrific, guess what? You have the agency to make a change and to experiment with different avenues, with different approaches. I think it's been really healthy. We've sort of been very dependent and our dependency shifted from traditional publishers to the retailers, mainly Amazon. What I think the current move toward direct sales is doing is it's really bringing home the agency, the, both the responsibility and the power to propel your own career. So I, I think it's a kind of combination of factors as our industry has matured over the, and it's done so really rapidly. 
over the last, particularly over the last five years, I would say. What do you think? Yeah, I think the last few years, and it seems to be speeding up that kind of desire. I mean, we've always been said we're independent authors, and yet a lot of people are pretty dependent on on one company. But there are some more, more practical things. Maybe you could just comment on the financial reason, I guess the speed and also the customer data side of Selling Direct, why those are a good idea. It's absolutely essential that we know who our customers are directly. And when we sell on Amazon, Amazon, not only do they not want to share their, that customer information with us, they can't. That's not something that they, that they have established as their terms of service and their rules. So what that means is whenever you have a list of, a call it 100,000 people, and you send those folks over to Amazon, some number of them will buy something from you, but you have no idea who they are. And so what happens is when you don't know exactly who your buyers are, it's infinitely harder to go find more of them. And so owning your customer data and the way that we own it is when they purchase directly from your web store, not only is that money deposited in like two or three business days instead of two or three months, that's really important as a business owner that your returns come back quickly so that you're not having to float your credit card debt for weeks and months while you're waiting to get paid. The other thing is that um, you can connect directly any advertising effort to the customers that it brings in. So this allows you to learn what works and what doesn't in a much tighter feedback loop and a much more refined feedback loop so that you know what's working and what isn't with a lot greater specificity. And that helps you grow, that helps you scale, and um, obviously it helps you to get paid sooner. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, just to repeat that, you get paid in two to three days, sometimes like really immediately as well, depending on the payment method, instead of two to three months or traditionally published authors might not get paid for six months or or more time. So I think that's super important. You did though say that if you have an email list of like a hundred thousand people, and I, I know everyone was like, well, we don't have that. So is Selling Direct only for massive authors with massive email lists? No, absolutely not. In fact, that's how we get those big email lists. And there's two ways that we approach it. The first way is sort of the traditional, get people hooked by giving away your first in series in exchange for an email address, after which we give them an immediate opportunity to purchase. And that was sort of the foundational approach. And so that grew our email list quite quickly. What we discovered through testing is that after COVID, people were much less leery of making online purchases. So we were able to profitably just advertise directly for the sale without having to give away a book in the interim in between there. Mm. And what that does for you is that every new person who shows up in your email service provider is a buyer. They're not on your list now if they're not buyers. And if you've had an email list for any length of time, I think you know instantly how valuable it is to have a list full of buyers instead of a list full of mainly free seekers and a couple of buyers or a small percentage of buyers. So if you're just starting out and you don't have a a big list, don't worry, that comes with time. And it's really a matter of just staying stuck in with the process and allowing things to grow because they do grow. They will grow if you feed it, if you continue to make adjustments and you continue to optimize the way your sales platform works, that list size will come. And if you're advertising directly for sales, that list size will come. Every time somebody new is on your list, it means that you have a new paying customer who's about to enjoy one or more of your books. So it's a virtuous circle that, a virtuous cycle that helps you grow. Yeah, and I've sold direct on various platforms for years. But up until seeing what you've been doing and seeing what others have been doing with Shopify, I didn't do one store because growing slowly, you do all these different services and stuff. But now, um, and a lot of people think this is digital only, but it's not digital only anymore, is it? No, not at all. And there's a large number of readers who will ever only and always read paperbacks or hardcovers. And like you, I've used a bunch of different store services, you know, Shopify, Kajabi, Samcart, others. There's a bunch of them that work for digital products. 
the reason that we recommend Shopify now is because it does the best job helping you manage physical inventory. It has the best integrations that allow you to hook up with print on demand services. And so you can sell your eBooks and your audiobooks on your Shopify store, but also your paperbacks, your hardcovers, your large print paperbacks, large print hardcovers, special editions, special box sets, all that kind of stuff. So it really does help you manage the physical copies. Mm, and in fact, your one of your Lars books is one of the first print books I have bought from Shopify store. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I yeah. feel quite honored. Hopefully you were able to slog through it. <laughs> oh, no, it was great. And what I liked was that it came with like a receipt that has, I think you're either your face on it or another book or some kind of branded material that essentially made me feel it was from your store. Whereas when I get a book in the post from Amazon, the receipt is an Amazon receipt. So I I think that's really interesting. It's a really powerful advantage that we have by selling direct is that we can be a face rather than a logo. And we're all nervous about how we look. None of us thinks that we're movie stars but it's okay. You're a real person and it deepens the connection that you have with your readers. And I think it really is beneficial to include your face in your marketing because people know your work and they enjoy your stories, but we have so much brain real estate devoted to recognizing faces Mm. and it really does help for recognition, for brand recognition and to boost future sales. So if you can stand to put your face on your brand, it really is useful. I I encourage everybody to do that. No matter how ugly we all think we are, we're not that ugly. (laughs) We're all just humans. And everyone has some interesting and something interesting about their face, because as you said, people recognize and look at faces. In fact, I think I saw on one of your various tutorials that you do ads with your face, with sort of holding a book or the ads with our faces in as authors can be surprisingly effective. Is that right? Or am I making that up? No, you're not making it up. It is right. It was very surprising to me. So I have a bunch of different ad types. I've tested probably thousands of different ad variations at this point. Most of the ones that do really well, I don't predict that they would do really well. That's the importance of testing. Mm. We discover that we have biases that are not shared by our market. It's that old adage that you are not your market. But one of the most surprising ones that worked the best was just my ugly mug on the advertisement. (laughs) (laughs) So that's the reason I recommend, hey, if you can get over your self-consciousness, just grit your teeth and put it out there and do use your face. Yeah, it's a tough one. And I know everyone listening, well, not everyone, a lot of people will be going, no blooming way, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <That's right. but laughs> yeah. And for those you. folks, I should say that, don't worry, there is an ad configuration that will likely work for you. So don't feel like this is the only thing, but it's just something definitely worth testing. So, I mean, testing is one thing you definitely emphasize, but what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen authors make with direct sales and how can we avoid them? Hmm. That's a good question. There's a bunch of technical mistakes that you can make that end up being quite debilitating. Even it's just down to fussy web stuff. Like you, somehow you have the wrong Facebook pixel on your landing page or something fussy like that. So it's the kind of game where it really does pay to pay attention to detail. But I think authors are good at that. I think we, we think very closely and very hard about things. We're pretty picky about sentence structure and the way that we say what we say and the sentences that we use to to tell our story. So I don't think it's abnormal for authors to sort of dig in and cozy up to the details. Those are the main ones that I find that are holding folks back. The other part is that there's not a single one-stop shopping solution that allows you to construct a, a profitable funnel. You have to put some tools together So that can feel intimidating. And I think it holds a lot of people back who otherwise would do very well, but they don't have much appetite. And I get it. They don't have much appetite for the technical, uh, you know, the technical lift. Mm. 
Yeah. And I mean, that I think that's true now of self-publishing and book marketing in general. You can still do this stuff offline. I mean, you can still go to fairs and sell books and conventions and stuff. And some people do really well with that. So that's one option. And the other option really is online. <laughs> so, I mean, do you think it's possible to be a very successful indie author now without trying some of this technical stuff yourself? Or can you just outsource the whole thing? I I should say that it's not economically feasible to outsource the whole thing in the beginning. Um, web marketing, it's a profession and people who do it for a living expect to be paid as professionals for good reason. It's a marriage of, of art. It's a marriage of data science. It's a marriage of web developer stuff. And there's some technical things that go into it. So it is a profession and those folks, you're not going to find them on Fiverr. Uh, <laughs> So if you want to make a go of it, I do think you need an effective and profitable online presence. I mean, we have folks in our community who do very well at conventions, but there's only so many conventions that you can go to. You can't go to one every day. And when you're at a convention or even a great weekend, you know, that it'll be a significant, it'll be a significant amount of money for the weekend, but it, there just aren't enough opportunities over the course of a year that you can really make a living off of just selling in-person physical copies. At least if there's somebody doing that, I haven't met them. And the mm -hmm. folks who are selling boatloads of physical copies every single day are doing that mainly digitally. They're mainly using the advertising marketing principles involved in direct sales and aiming them at physical copy sales. So I don't, if there's a test case for somebody who's doing that, very successfully at scale uh, with physical copies and only in-person appearances. I haven't met them to pick their brain on how they've done it. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because to me, sitting at a conventional day is more terrifying than trying to build <laughs> yeah. something online. So, I mean, we all have our the things we have to do <laughs> to sell our books. And yeah, I mean, right. I have a de degree in theology and I learned how to do this. So I think that over time, you either learn the skills you need to learn or you can outsource all this to a publisher and go the traditional publishing route, right? I mean, mm. and you pay, mm -hmm. you basically pay the publisher up to 90% really for for them doing all this. So we have to remember there are trade-offs as authors and you have to choose your trade-off. Like you can't just write your books. You have to do something else, right? You have to figure out what you are willing to do for this career. Yeah, I agree. It dawned on me at some point that there, there really is no career that is just an author, just a writer right now. And there, there might have been in the past for a small number of very talented, but also very lucky writers who did win the traditional publishing lottery. Not only did they get published, but really they sold. And, um, but that's a small number of folks. That's, that opportunity still exists in the same sort of probability spaces like becoming a lottery winner, right? You know, somebody's going to win the lottery every year, but it's probably not going to be you. <laughs> so that's not a model that we can try to replicate. And then, Everybody else, well, we're in the position of needing to create really excellent books and also to create an excellent business that puts those books in the best light in front of the right readers. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it's different sides of our brains. It's hard for me to switch back and forth. I have to devote entire days to one type of work, creative or administrative marketing detail work is a much different headspace for me than creating stories. And, um, and also I, I create music as well. Same kind of deal. It's hard to flip back and forth, but I don't know of any other way to do it successfully right now. And mm -hmm. I think it's been that way for years. We've needed to have some business acumen and some skills that we, we wouldn't like, we wouldn't wake up dreaming, gosh, I really wish I understood my ads manager more deeply. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> But we just sort of pick these things up along the way as necessary skills to move us forward. Yeah. And uh, you actually have a course on this. You mentioned there your community and also test cases. And I've watched some of your videos and you have some really interesting information that I think is different to some of the other courses out there because it does cover this direct sales process. So tell us a, a bit about that course. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's called Ammo, Author Marketing Mastery Through Optimization. I came at it um, applying 
other from principal principles and skills I learned from other online businesses, I aimed those processes and adapted them to book selling. So I knew I was on pretty solid footing. What I didn't know is if I could make the whole thing work with enough profit margin to be to be useful, to be profitable. But it turns out that with some optimization, which just means testing to find out what works, that it is, it is quite profitable. That process is not terribly obvious or intuitive. So it does help to have a bit of guidance. And over the years, I've seen thousands and thousands of tests. I've worked with hundreds of startups in all sorts of different industries doing basically the same thing. The hundred true and accurate ways that you can describe your book or your service or your product. But how do you know which of those ways resonates best with your audience? And so that's just the process of testing to help discover what that is, put your books in the best light, in the most relevant light for your audience, and good things happen. So again, the course is called Ammo. It is open for enrollment at the moment. If you'd like to check out the first video in the series, it walks through the structure that we use, and it gives some examples of some successful advertisements that, that I've used over the years. You can sign up for that at moauthor.com. And that's a double mo. Yes, ma'am. Moauthor.com. <laughs> and mo again is author marketing mastery through optimization. It's an Brilliant. Acronym. And I'll put the links in the show notes, but I think that's the video I watched that had the example of your add in. So, yeah, even just, I think it's like an hour, isn't it? That video is really useful. It is about, I think, about 55 minutes or so. And obviously, there's an opportunity to enroll in the course. But as I go through that sales process, I'm also sort of with a wink and a nod telling you what I'm doing from a sales process as I'm doing it to give you a sense for how you might apply that to your book selling business. Mm, fantastic. So let's change tack a little bit because we share an interest in blockchain and NFTs. And you recently minted the incident with book.io. So tell us, uh, like, why are you interested in NFTs and how does it tie into selling direct? Oh, this is such a great, uh, it's such a great threat. I know lots of people are, their eyes are glazing over and they're thinking about all sorts of online scams and craziness. And there is some of that for sure. But the way that I came at blockchain was through Bitcoin. I was thinking very deeply about what is value? What is money? How do you store it? How do you keep it from disappearing while you're storing it? And I was doing this in the process of writing a trilogy that sort of explores um, the fragility of the financial system and what some kind of consequences might be. And what I learned is that the blockchain technology is actually a terrific way to make hard money. So money that's very difficult for governments to just print at their will, causing a lot of in inflation. And this gets into financial and global politics and whatnot, but it's important stuff that I think if we're not already paying attention to you as a general public, we will be before too long. And so I've been watching this technology advance. I've been participating in it. Um, you know, our, my participation in Bitcoin over the years has certainly changed our lives. And then as the non-fungible token thing became a thing, at first I didn't really understand it. People were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a picture of a monkey or something crazy like that. And, but I knew something, something is happening here. I don't know what it is. And what NFTs allow is digital property. You own a cryptographically unique copy of the books that you buy through book.io on NFTs. You actually own it. You can sell it again. And if you sell it again, you'll reap the profit when you sell it. And you can give it away, you can lend it, you can do whatever you want with it. And uh, this is different than the agreement that we have, say, as, a, as an Amazon customer or a Barnes & Noble customer. When we quote unquote buy a book, we're really just buying the right to read it. We don't own any other rights. And in fact, when those companies exit markets or when they delist books, they disappear from your reader automatically. So you don't actually own them. But NFTs are a way, um, and the only way that I know of, to avoid the copy and paste problem with digital property. And so it's 
it, it sounds a little bit esoteric, but you can think of it in terms of when you go to a bookstore and you purchase a hardcover, that's yours. You can sell it at a garage sale if you want. You can give it to your friends. You can do whatever you want with that copy. Well, you now have that ability digitally. And so uh, it's quite revolutionary, even though it sounds obvious and kind of simple. I really do think it's a game changer. So it's something to watch. Yeah, me too. I mean, listeners will know I'm very interested in the space and I've minted and I, I think it's super interesting. I do wonder whether by the time the general public, even most authors use NFTs, they won't, we won't use that that word anymore or that those letters anymore. It will be like nobody knows that they're reading an EPUB file when they get a book on their Kindle or their Kobo or their phone or whatever, it's like this, it, the word is almost too technical and it, perhaps it will just be digital assets or another word that will get rid of the scammy connotations that have happened because of the last sort of year and the crypto crashes and all of that kind of thing. What do you reckon? What do you see coming in the next few years? I, I share that view that what we're seeing right now is sort of the the hood of the car or the bonnet is open and you can see the, the greasy engine in there spinning and it doesn't seem like anything that you want to be a part of. There will come a time when we have tools that make it far more transparent. And one of the tools book, book.io is developing right now, which is a reader for your handheld device. So it'll be a lot more like current ebook purchases and reading experience will be in the future. The major difference being that you own the property. And this is interesting because it, it puts books in the category of digital collectibles. Mm -hmm. So as an author gains notoriety and as an author's work becomes more popular and valuable, the copies that are owned by individual people will also become more valuable. So it'll be sort of like investing in fine art, if you will, where it holds value over time rather than the opposite. So that's yeah. an interesting, a neat idea. Mm, yeah. I mean, I say to people, oh, well, you could buy a Charles Dickens ebook. Well, you don't even need to have to buy it. You can get a Charles Dickens ebook for free right now on your Kindle or your Kobo or whatever. Or you could go and buy a first edition <laughs> print that's copy, right. and that's going to cost you, I don't even know how much, thousands of pounds. And so that's kind of what we're saying, right? You know, we all value our digital world and our digital life. Like my website, your website, these don't physically exist in the, the physical world, but yet they're worth money. So what why shouldn't digital assets be worth money? I mean, it almost feels to me like authors are forgetting that digital things are worth something. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I feel like it'll be almost like anything else. It'll, it'll seem to most people that it never has a chance until it's just a part of everyday life. And then it will seem like it was always an inevitability. Like that's this weird kind of social phenomenon that happens where it's hard for people to project into the future and to understand conceptually what a thing might become until it's already become that. And then it feels like it's always been there, just like the sunrise or your furniture. You know what I mean? Like it's, I think we're on that kind of trajectory with these things. And I think it will be not but a couple of years, a couple more years before they're much more mainstream. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you mentioned earlier that you're a musician. And in terms of looking into the future, the music industry is always ahead of the publishing industry, the book publishing industry. So is there anything else you see out of the music industry that might be reflected in the author industry over the next few years? I think so. I think, like you say, I mean, the music industry is a harder business by far than, than the book business. And the book business is not easy, as we all know. So there are a lot of really motivated, intelligent, scrappy people in the music world who are looking for innovative new ways. I certainly have my own ideas and in the beginnings of a, um, of a project that feels quite ambitious now, but hopefully will be a marriage of the best of, of music and storytelling and video production using AI art in the videos. I know that's another topic entirely, but there's really amazing things happening right now. As you know, Joe, in the uh, AI art world where AIs are generating really incredible graphics. Mm. So that's exciting. The idea is to create an asset worth having. And 
something that people want to collect and can enjoy, get some utility out of in the process of collecting them. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where all of this lands. It'll be interesting to see how the technology develops. And these are really, really exciting times. Even if you're not, if this kind of stuff is not really up your alley, you know, technically, I think it's still worthwhile to start getting an idea conceptually of what's happening because I, th- I do think it will be a major economic force here, certainly in the next decade, probably in the next five years. What are your thoughts on it? I know you've spoken about this in the past. Any updates? <laughs> yeah. On- well, it's funny. I mean, I one of the reasons I went with Shopify and, you know, it was quite a big deal for me. I had mm-hmm. a lot of different products. And I mean, it's almost easier to start a Shopify store when you've only got a couple of books. And it took me a lot of building. But one of the reasons I did it was because of NFTs mm-hmm. and cryptocurrency, because Shopify, I have this functionality in beta right now, this token gated commerce. And I'm encouraged that they enable a lot of things that I think are not mainstream right now, but are going Mm. to be mainstream. So I can really see that I'll sell my NFT editions next to my special hardback, Mm. next to my audiobook, and next to a mug, you know, or something Mm -hmm. and and a journal. And so I kind that's how I see it. It's it's this selling direct can be all kinds of digital collectibles and physical products and everything. And I I guess that's why it's so great to talk to you because I feel like you have that vision too. It's that the author is the brand, right? In the future, that's where, I mean, they should be already, but by controlling your your commerce site, that is much more truly a brand and a business than it is now. Instead of having all these different things, I mean, we'll still have all the different things, (laughs) but we'll also have our hub. Yes, absolutely. Very, very well said. I think the doors are really wide open for all sorts of opportunities. And when you have a brand, rather than just a series of products, it really allows you to increase your profit margin. It allows you to sell more things to your fans and super fans. And it's a virtuous cycle where you can have a more profitable and enjoyable business and you can give you can deliver a lot more value to the people who really value what you produce. Mm, fantastic. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Thank you. If you want to check out the thrillers, I'll say they're a little edgy and not for everybody, but you can do that at lars.buzz. I don't know what you'll see when you get there because I'm constantly testing new configurations, but the best deal available at any moment is at Lars.buzz. And if you are interested in checking out what we're doing in the direct sales department, that website is ammoauthor.com. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Steve. That was great. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. And thanks for all that you do for us as indie authors. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Steve and that it gave you some ideas around selling direct and shifting your mindset to be more empowered about your author business. Next week on the usual Monday show, we're back to craft. I'm talking to Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, who is Choctaw, and we talk about terminology like American Indian, writing diversity, how to research different points of view and cultures, and why we need to talk about these things rather than shy away from them if they feel too difficult. Also, this is the last chance to back my Kickstarter, (laughs) as it will be over by the time next week's show goes out. So if you'd like Pilgrimage in any format, including the audiobook read by me, or the writing setting course, or my extra backer-only How to Write Travel Memoir and turn pages and pages of journals and hundreds of photos into a book, then head on over to jfpen.com forward slash pilgrimage. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.